Hi, my name is Nancy Weinbeck and I'm the CEO here at Bayview. Uh, we are so delighted and happy that you are here at New Employee Orientation and that you've chosen to work at Bayview and become part of the Bayview family. And I say that with all sincerity because we know it's a tight job market out there. You have lots of opportunities and we are very grateful that you chose Bayview. So I'm gonna give you a little introduction about the history of Bayview, um, who we are and what we're about, and then you will be hearing from many of our other uh, directors uh, uh, throughout the day. So first, Bayview is a nonprofit life plan community, and that's really important. Uh, nonprofit means that our bottom line goes back to serve the mission of the organization, uh, as opposed to for-profit, where their bottom line goes back to serve the shareholders or the owners of the company. We are all about our mission, which is serving our residents and also serving our staff, because if we're not serving our staff, our residents are also not getting served. So you are a critical part of our mission. Here is Bayview's creation story, which is, uh, which is important uh, because it shows that we are continually tied back to our mission to serve our residents. Back in the 1950s, uh, there was a radio pastor. His name was Dr. Cyrus Albertson. He was actually the lead pastor of Seattle First Methodist Church. It wasn't united yet. Um, Dr. Albertson broadcasted his, his service every Sunday and um, he was, uh, it was very popular back in the day and one of his radio fans was a gentleman by the name of Charles Kinnear. Charles Kinnear was the son of Captain George Kinnear who was one of the original pioneer families that settled in this area. In fact, many of the streets around Seattle are named after uh, George Kinnear and his family. For example, Roy Street, just below us, was one of uh, George's sons. So Charles Kinnear and Dr. Albertson developed a very close relationship through, his, through Dr. Albertson's radio sermons. And when Charles Kinnear was, towards the end of his life, he decided that he was going to will his property, and that's the property that Baby sits on today, um, to the church uh, for the care of seniors and or children. And that was all due to that relationship that he had with Dr. Albertson. Well, Charles died in 1958, and in 1961, Bayview opened its doors. And so where you're sitting right now probably is our terrace building. This used to be part of the front lawn of the Kinnear Estate, and this building was built in 1995. The tower, the original tower, is what went up in 1961. So soon, in April of 2021, we will be celebrating our 60th anniversary, and that's very exciting uh, that we have been serving our mission to serve seniors and honoring the wishes of the uh, Kinnear family and, George, and Charles Kinnear for so many years. At Bayview, one of the things you're gonna hear about is our, uh, our core values, and it's, they can be, <laughs> wordy and lengthy, um, but they really come down to three key words, and that is community, integrity, and purpose. And those three words are our guideposts for everything we do here at Bayview. Those are the lenses we look at um, through everything we do. And I, I like to think of Bayview uh, sort of like uh, Subaru. <laughs> which is that love is what makes Bayview, Bayview. And that's one of the things you're gonna experience becoming part of our Bayview family is the love that you are going to receive and give to our residents. We are bound by love here 
and bound by our mission to serve. And we are so glad you're here. So thank you and welcome to Bayview. To new employee orientation, my name is Amrita Torwal. I work here as HR generalist. We are so excited and glad that all of you are part of Bayview team now. So today's main agenda is to tell you more about Bayview's history, about our policies and procedures, about our rules and regulations. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our benefits as well. So let's start pretty quick. As Nancy has already uh, told you more about Bayview's history, so I'm going to take it pretty fast from here. Bayview is a not-for-profit continuing care retirement community that's dedicated to providing residents with excellent service and care. Our mission statement, which is written on the back side of your employee card as well, transforming the experience of aging by creating opportunities for healthy and spiritual and purposeful living for our residents, children, staff, and greater community. History of Bayview in 1956, the Methodist Church received donation of the Kinnair Mansion and 1.7 acres of land donated by Charles Kinnair. Under the terms of the Kinnair will, the property was to be used to provide a home for the elderly pastors of the church or children. So it was decided by church leadership to establish a home for the elderly, then referred to as Seattle First Methodist Home. In 1959, the tower was built and opened in 1961. In 1989, the corporate name was changed to Bayview Manor Homes. In 1994, the terrace addition was built, which included space for the children care, the wellness center, a 50-bed skilled nursing unit, covered parking spaces, and administration offices. In 1995, Bayview opened the intergenerational child care center, which fulfilled the children's home, emphasis of the Kinnair Bill. The child care center accommodates 43 children on a daily basis, including children from outside communities as well as children of Bayview employees. In 2000, the wellness center opened its store, which offers exercise and rehab program to seniors at Bayview and the outside community. In 2005, Bayview Manor changed its street name to Bayview Retirement Community or for informal use, Bayview. Now let's talk about Bayview's expectations. As a not-for-profit organization, we are committed to employ quality people and high ethical standards. We expect 100% commitment from you and promote excellence based upon the fundamental values such as honesty, fairness, integrity, respect, and accountability in all of your business activities. Bayview encourages open, honest communication. If you believe there to be any inappropriate or illegal business practices at Bayview, you are encouraged to report your observations using our grievance procedure or the compliance hotline number, which is again on your employee card. You can call on that number anytime if you see anything wrong is happening within the building. We also expect maintain resident and operations information confidentiality. Standards of conduct while working at Bayview, you are expected to adhere to Bayview standards of conduct, treat all residents, co-workers and guests with courtesy, kindness and respect. Speak only English while working. We um, request all our employees to speak while uh, English while working as we have few of our residents who are patients of dementia and mental health. So if they hear different dialects, sometimes they get confused. That's why we request all our employees to speak in English while working, use company resources properly, create a positive caring environment for residents as well as for staff. Adhere to all company policies and practices outlined in your employee handbook. Bayview does guarantee that this facility will be free of certain activities or conditions that interfere with its environment. Now let's talk about harassment and discrimination. What is harassment? Has harassment or discrimination of a person because of their protected class is strictly prohibited. Now what is protected class? Protected class is a group of people who are protected by the law for any kind of employment discrimination. Now, these class can be made on the basis of age, color, disability, 
gender identity, genetic information, marital status, military status, national origin, political ideology, race, religion, sex or sexual orientation. Now it's very important for all of us to know type of harassments. Harassment is any conduct that shows hostility or a strong dislike to someone because of his or her protected class that interferes with that person's ability to do their work or creates an intimidating or hostile work environment. Now uh, let's talk about types of harassment. Visual leering making sexual gestures inappropriate pictures um so in my previous organization we had one incident and when uh one employee he he just took someone else's picture uh, in the elevator when they were going up and the other person felt offended because he took his picture without his permission so they filed a case of sexual harassment if we talk about physical harassment, touching, impeding or blocking movements, again we had one incident when someone was trying to be funny and they were blocking someone's movement but the other person felt offended and they filed a case. Again verbal, offensive comments, slurs, jokes or proposition as nowadays all of us use social media, we share messages, we share videos. So it's very important for us to understand with whom we are sharing and what we are sharing. Sexual, quid pro quo, touching, persuading, pressuring and grabbing. If you believe that you are experiencing any form of harassment, you should report the alleged conduct immediately to HR. But first, you should say stop. It is your responsibility to say stop and then you should uh, um, facilitate this to your uh, supervisor you can report this to the hr and any other person on the management team that you feel comfortable with drug and violence free workplace bayview prohibits the illegal manufacture purchase distribution use sales possession of alcohol narcotics drugs illegal pursuant to the state local or federal laws although where Washington state has legalized marijuana, the company is not required to allow the medicinal use of marijuana in the workplace. Marijuana use or being under the influence is strictly prohibited on company property and while conducting company business. Bayview has zero tolerance policy for any actions that threaten its employee, customers or vendors and is committed to providing a workplace that is safe and free from all threatening and intimidating conduct. Safety. Bayview is very much concerned about his employees and residents' safety. Management's responsibility towards safety is to provide resources, training, and follow through to ensure policies and safety procedures are followed. Supervisors' responsibility towards safety of their employees by accessing unsafe work conditions or practices. And now, Safety, what is your responsibility? Assist, identify and report any potential hazards or unsafe work condition. Be aware of yourself, of others and your surroundings. And be safe, familiarize yourself with Bayview's Accident Prevention Program and know your specific department work rules. That is very important for us as we have different kind of departments, Depart department uh, work rules for food staff will be totally different from nursing staff as food staff on daily basis they deal with fire, they deal with knives but on the other hand nursing staff they deal with needles, they deal with blood. So it's very important to know your specific department work rules and follow them. Working hours and break period. Bayview is 24-7 working facility. Our work week is from Sunday to Saturday and you get 15 minutes to 15 minutes break which are paid and one unpaid 30 minute meal break automatically deducted after working 5 hours. Time clock use for payroll and attendance purposes. Employees are required to clock in and clock out. Clock in at the beginning of your scheduled shift and clock out when you complete your shift. Each employee is responsible for maintaining accurate time records, including request for benefit time. 
and if you are having any problem while clocking in clocking out or entering your hours please contact your supervisor hr or director and our chronos is our uh, system which we have already given you all the paperwork to download the app which is very helpful for this as we have only one machine on the a floor so if you download the app you can clock in and clock out from your mobile whenever you are within the building and you can check your pto's you can check your pay statement so please make sure to go ahead and download the app if you don't have the info please contact hr we will provide you all the information how to download the app and we can give you a demo of how to use it <clears throat> attendance regular attendance and timeliness are essential for everyone if you are unable to make it to work you must contact your supervisor at least two hours in advance and if you work for health center or alu we recommend <coughs> sorry four hours in advance the reason is that here uh, we are going to talk about our values as we were earlier talked about kindness so here it comes about kindness because we cannot uh, leave residence we have to provide them and we ensure to provide them service so if you are not coming to work your co-workers are going to suffer from that if you at the just half an hour before you tell your supervisor that i cannot come then the other person who has already been working has to cover your shift so please kind towards your co-workers and let your supervisor know in advance if you cannot make it to work Failure to do so will be considered a no-call, no-show. Excessive tardiness, absences or failure to keep your supervisor informed may be a cause of corrective action. Dress code. Dress appropriately for your job duties. Your clothing should be neat, clean and in good condition. In accordance with your department established dress code, uh, I think there are departments who have specific dress code, so just make sure that you follow the dress code. Now let's talk about benefits. So benefits is for full-time employees working 30 plus hours a week. And for benefits, uh, you can anytime come to HR and we can explain it to you in detail. So I will take it pretty quick to the benefits. For medical, we have Kaiser Permanente and we have two plans, base plan and buyer plan. In base plan, Bayview pays 80% of premium, approximately $30 per pay period and for non-tobacco users and for tobacco users $37 and for buyer plan approximately $62 uh, per pay period uh, and the difference between base plan and buyer plan main difference is that in uh, buyer plan you can go to any doctor out of the network but in base plan you have to stay in network doctors for dental we have Delta Dental again we have base plan and buyer plan for vision we have VSP for additional voluntary benefits, we have life insurance and accidental death and dismemberment, flexible spending account, daycare immediately, 403B plan available to part-time employees working 20 plus hours a week and uh, they may participate immediately and full-time employees only after one year, Bayview matches up to 4% of gross earning. Now uh, we have other benefits like shoes for crews. Um, Trust me, these benefits are very much useful on daily basis. Like Shoes for Crews, it's a great website. They have various pattern and various kind of shoes. If you order a shoes from Shoes for Crews, you have to fill a form and then you will get 50% off uh, each year. Each year, 50% off on uh, one pair of shoe. So 50% will be paid by Bayview. Orca passport program, we have Orca program if you use uh, <clears throat> a daily commute by bus or train then you can definitely use this Orca passport program. Employee assistant program, we have this amazing program but I would say this is the most underused program here. If you are having any problem in your life, any personal, professional and if you want any guidance in your career, if you are looking for other good um, you know uh, if you want to go ahead and do complete your college if you're looking for a good degree 
you should use this program there are experts who can guide you you can talk to them and explain your problem and definitely you will get good results again we have Bayview's wellness center and pool which you can use anytime and we have library as well so uh, i think yeah that's it thank you very much for your attention and again welcome to bayview and uh, hr team is always available for you if you have any question if you have any concern you can call us anytime email us anytime and we will try our best to answer your questions thank you very much hi i'm jamie hart and i'm the director of social services i have been at bayview now 17 years which seems pretty crazy because i don't feel like i'm old enough to say that i've worked anywhere for 17 years um, I think that's probably a sign that I'm in denial about my own aging, perhaps. Uh, but anyway, welcome to all of you. Uh, glad uh, that you have chosen to work at Bayview, and I look forward to getting to know all of you guys. So as the Director of Social Services, uh, my job takes me in many different directions. I do all the transitions and the levels of care here, so as people's needs start to increase, it is my job to work with residents and their families to help um, help get them situated, help look at what their options are and help, uh, help their needs be met. I also do all of our admissions to our skilled nursing facility. So for those of you who work in skilled nursing, I'll be interacting with you a lot as I uh, coordinate people coming from the hospital into our skilled nursing. And then in addition to that, I am also responsible for doing training with all, with all employees. So um, all new employees I do training with as well as uh, Every employee here at Bayview, I do annual trainings on the issue of abuse and neglect. Uh, for many of you, you will already have had exposure to this. So for all of our nurses and nursing assistants, you've already been trained in your education on uh, the issue of mandatory reporting and what to do if you ever suspect that a resident is being abused or neglected. But for others of you uh, in food service, in uh, um, housekeeping, anybody in maintenance, those of you who are working at our reception area, this may be brand new information for you and that's okay. We just wanna make sure that every single employee here knows what to do if they ever encounter a situation of abuse or neglect. So since this is really just a brief, um, a brief training, I encourage you if you have questions that come up um, as you're listening to me talk, um, that, you, that you seek me out or you seek out your supervisor and ask those questions. But we also will be doing, like I said, annual training. So if you work with us for any length of time, which I hope you do, uh, you will have exposure to this training every single year. So the issue of mandatory reporting. Um, mandatory reporting is a law that says there are certain professionals in this world that are required by that law to report suspected abuse or neglect to the state. Um, many of you are mandatory reporters because of a license that you hold. So for nurses and nursing assistants, any therapist, you guys are mandatory reporters wherever you are because of your license as that professional. Myself, I'm a mandatory reporter because I'm a social worker. Uh, other people who are mandatory reporters would be policemen, uh, physicians, um, uh, firemen, school teachers, all of them the law of mandatory reporting applies to. For many of you, you are now a mandatory reporter because you work in a healthcare facility serving a vulnerable population. Now, for example, those of you in food service, if you are working at a restaurant downtown, this law would not apply to you. You could still make a report to the state if you ever had concerns about abuse or neglect, but you would not be required by law to. However, now that you are an employee of Bayview, this law now applies to you. So it's really important that you have a good understanding of what mandatory reporting is and um, what abuse is and what, what to be looking out for so that you know exactly what to do if you ever encounter a situation of abuse or neglect here at Bayview. Now there's big cases that make the news um, regarding abuse and neglect. A couple in the last handful of years, a couple big name cases, the situation with Penn State football is an example of one. It's a, it was made such huge news, not only because it was abuse that was going on, but also because of the laws of mandatory reporting and people not falling through on their responsibility to report suspected abuse or neglect when it was brought to their attention. Uh, USA Gymnastics is another great example. Um, sorry, not a great example, it's a horrible example, but it's an example not only of systemic abuse that was going on, 
but also the failure of many individuals to fulfill their responsibility of mandatory reporting. And that is what allowed the abuse to continue on for years decades even, uh, without the abuse stopping. So once again, to sum up, mandatory reporting is a law that says that for all of you listening to this, because you are uh, working in a healthcare facility serving a vulnerable population, if a resident ever tells you that they've been abused or neglected, if you ever see a concern of abuse or neglect, or you have suspicion that abuse or neglect is happening, it's not most of your jobs to figure out did it actually happen or not. It's not most of your jobs to investigate. Your job is to make a report. Um, we are making a report to our nurse so that they can start the investigation. We are also making a report to the state hotline. Um, for those of you who have worked at other healthcare communities, the policy can vary from facility to facility. So at some facilities I know, uh, they require their employees to report it to an administrator. And then the administrator is the one who makes the report to the state hotline. And the reason why some communities have their policy be that way is because the law actually says that you either need to make a report to the state or you need to ensure that a report is being made to the state. Bayview's perspective on that is really the only way for you to actually make sure a report is being made is for you to do it yourself. So your responsibility if you ever see or hear about abuse is to make a report to the nurse and you're going to be making a report to that state hotline and we'll talk a little bit later about where that number is on where you can find the state hotline number there are several different categories of abuse and you're going to be receiving a handout that is going to give you some examples of those but i just want to briefly run through those um, as i'm talking about the different categories and different examples of abuse i want you to keep in mind that Abuse happens at the best of places. Bayview is a wonderful place. I mean, it's a wonderful place. We have great employees, we have great residents, we have great families. But all of the categories of abuse that I'm going to talk about have all occurred here at Bayview. Um, so I want you to, I think there's often this myth that um, abuse doesn't happen um, at the bright, shiny, fancy places, but it does. Generally speaking, when we're talking about abuse and the abuse that has occurred here, we normally aren't talking about employees who are being abusive towards our residents. However, we have dealt with that here. Um, generally speaking, we're talking about uh, visitors who uh, are exploiting or being abusive towards residents, oftentimes family members as well. Sometimes it's residents who are being abusive to other residents. It's important for us to recognize that no matter who the person who it is that is doing the abuse or the suspected abuse, our responsibility to report is the same no matter what. Um, there are some isolated occasions where we are required to also report it to the police, which I'm not going to get into in great detail here. Um, but whether it's a resident who is being abusive, a family member who is being abusive, uh, an employee who is being abusive, our responsibility to report it to the state is the same no matter what. So please keep that in mind as we're talking through examples. So the first main category of abuse is physical abuse. This can be anything from you know raising a fist at a person to punching them in the face, really, uh, every, and everything in between. It doesn't matter whether there is an injury, truly. I mean, obviously it matters to, it matters to the resident who's being abused, right? Um, sorry, I don't mean to make a joke out of that, but it's important to keep in mind that an injury does not have to be present for it to be considered to be abuse. Raising a fist and threatening a person is considered to be physical abuse. It's also considered to be emotional abuse. We are required to report that to the state even though the resident wasn't physically injured. It is still considered to be abuse. So anything, raising a fist at a person, punching, kicking, slapping, spitting at a person, um, those are all considered to be physical physical abuse and those are all reportable to the state. So the next category of abuse is verbal abuse. And verbal abuse happens everywhere in our world. I mean, verbal abuse is anything from yelling at a person, swearing at a person, um, calling somebody a name, threatening a person would be verbal abuse as well. Um, everybody who's listening to this has been verbally abused at some point in your life and chances are you've also been the person doing verbal abuse at some point in your life 
I grew up with three siblings, three brothers, and there was a lot of verbal abuse going on in my household, not from my parents directed towards us, but us siblings, we would get in fights. We'd call each other names. That is verbal abuse, okay? Um, the difference in what we're talking about now, though, is with our seniors, there are laws that are protecting them from verbal abuse, whether it's verbal abuse who uh, perpetuated by a spouse, um, whether it's a family member, another family member who is verbally abusing a resident, whether it's staff or another resident who is being verbally abusive. Uh, we are responsible for reporting that to the state and we're also responsible for putting interventions in place to try to keep it, try to keep it from happening again. Uh, we've come across situations here before where a spouse is being verbally or sometimes even physically abusive to another spouse and staff have looked at that and said, well, they're married, they're just arguing, married couples fight. Well, I, I'm not married, but I'm assuming that is true that, uh, you know, you get in arguments when you're in a relationship. Um, but verbal abuse is never okay, all right? So we have had to report situations of verbal abuse going on between, between spouses. It is still abuse. So remember back to the point I was making earlier that it doesn't matter who the perpetrator is. Our responsibility to report is the same no matter what. Our interventions to prevent it from happening again are gonna vary depending on the situation and depending on who the person is doing the abusing, but our responsibility to report is the same no matter what. Next section is on, uh, next category is emotional abuse, which is also considered to be mental abuse or um, psychological abuse, it's also called. This is anything from harassing a resident to humiliating them, intimidating them, isolating them. Uh, to give you an example of emotional abuse, we once, many years ago, had a nurse uh, who didn't like the behavior of one of our residents. And our resident was, he was challenging, um, but what our nurse decided to do is tell the man that he had to go to his room until he could behave. Something similar to what maybe he would do with his child at home. Well, we don't get to do that with our residents. Our residents are not children. Um, but what our nurse did was took the man to his room, told him he had to stay there until he could behave. He charted all this word for word in quotes as well. The resident started crying, said, I've calmed down. I'll do what you want. I'll behave now. The nurse said, you know, no, I don't believe you. I'll believe it when I see it and left the room and closed the door, which for this particular man who could not open the door by himself was also the same as not just putting him in a timeout, but he was essentially locking him in his room. Um, and then he, of course, you know, charted every single word of this. And so I'm looking through the chart of this resident, see all this information. And it was a very, very clear example of emotional abuse, of isolation, also some intimidation. Uh, and so that was something that, report, that was reported to the state. Next category is uh, sexual abuse. Uh, sexual abuse is the one you know category of abuse that definitely makes the news when it happens uh, because it's, uh, it's horrifying that it occurs in facilities. Uh, we have dealt with a situation here of sexual abuse that occurred between residents. A really difficult situation to handle in working with the residents, protecting the residents, um, uh, or working with the families and explaining to families what happened, what intervention we were going to put in place to keep it from happening again. Uh, sexual abuse happens even at the very best of places. When I first started working with seniors, I was working at a, a, a dementia community in Eugene, Oregon. And I was not smart when I interviewed for the job. I did not ask why the position was open or what happened to the previous social worker. But what I learned my first day on the job was that the social worker and the head nurse were both fired as a result of the state survey process. And when the state surveyors came into the community, what they found was that there was sexual abuse going on between residents. And there were no interventions ever put in place to keep it from happening again. They also never reported it to the state. All the staff did was they documented it, they separated the residents at the time, um, but they didn't do anything to keep it from happening the next hour or the next day or the next week. And uh, the staff basically looked at that situation and thought, well, these are residents who have dementia, so they don't know what they're doing. Well, that may, not be, that may be true that they don't know what they're doing, 
but it still isn't okay. We still need to report it. It still is sexual abuse, and we still are needing to protect the vulnerable people who are being abused. And what was going on in that community is there truly were three sexual predators. There were two men and one woman who were sexual predators on a unit of 30 people. And they were sexually assaulting people almost every night. It was, it was horrifying and disgusting what I read. And sad, sad to know that this abuse had been going on for a while. And all that was being done was that they were separating the residents and then they were documenting it. Families weren't being informed. The state wasn't being informed. Nobody was care planning around it to try to prevent it from happening again. And so that allowed the abuse to continue to go on and on and on. Next category of abuse is financial abuse. And this is the one that I deal with the most, the most often here. And I tell you, after 17 years, I have a lot of stories. So if you want some stories uh, of what goes on with seniors and the exploitation and how horrendous it can be, come, come find me <laughs> because I, got, I have a lot of stories. But to give you an example of a few, uh, we have had situations where we've had an employee who was stealing checks from residents and forging, forging their signatures and stealing money from residents that way. We uh, have had strangers on the street who have come into contact with our residents and exploited them out of thousands of dollars. To give you an example, I had, we had an assisted living resident once who uh, met a man out on the street who gave him a really you know, sad story about his parents were in a nursing home, they had no money to pay to be there, they were going to get kicked out and they were going to live on the streets, they had nowhere to go. You know, and this man on the street then asked our resident, can you, can you help me out? Can you give me some money? And so our resident had a little bit of dementia, believed the story, went to the ATM and gave this man money. Well, during the course of their conversation, this man on the street learned where our resident lived and called him the next day and said, hey, I really need more money. This place is threatening to kick my parents out. Can you help me out? And our resident um, fell for this story again, and uh, this man picked him up in his car and started driving him around to different banks, withdrawing money. And finally, a teller at the Bank of America in Capitol Hill got a hold of me and said, hey, I have some concerns because I have one of your residents here, and I have concerns about the transactions he's made today. Uh, $38,000 had been withdrawn in one day, and what was happening was this man, who we never learned the name of him, was driving a resident around from bank to bank to bank, withdrawing $9,000 at a time. Apparently, I've never tried to withdraw $9,000, but apparently if you do that, if you try to withdraw more than $10,000, sorry, uh, that sets up an alert with the bank. So they knew to have our man go in and ask for $9,000. So thankfully, bank tellers are also trained in financial exploitation and signs to look for with regards to financial exploitation. And this bank teller finally saw these transactions and thought, wow, something's not right here and called me. And I said, call the police and I will be there right away. And I went and picked up our resident. Of course, he never got that, any of that money back and the man was long gone. Um, so a very clear example right there of financial exploitation. Another one I want to tell you about, um, we learned about because of a staff member who had gone through repeated trainings on financial exploitation and realized that something didn't sound right. She was working in our fitness center and overheard one of our residents who was on an exercise machine, also talking on her cell phone at the same time, so clearly she wasn't exercising very hard, right? Um, but her, the employee heard the resident saying, how much money do you want? He doesn't know, he'll give me anything I ask for. And by hearing that conversation, the employee reported that to me and said, hey, I have concerns about something I heard today. And when I heard what resident was, I knew immediately who she was talking to because she was one of our independent residents but had a very good friend in our assisted living. And by starting a very simple investigation, we found that she was going to this man in assisted living asking him to write her checks and he didn't know he wasn't in control of his own finances i'm not actually sure why he had a checkbook in his office or in his apartment but she was getting him to write checks that then he she was sending to her low-income daughter in california 
$19,000 she coerced out of this man who they had a relationship, but he had dementia and he did not know what he was doing. But because of their relationship, she was able to manipulate that situation to get that $19,000 from him, okay? That is a situation where uh, by an alert employee just hearing something that did not sound quite right, uh, we were able to stop it and stop a situation of very clear financial exploitation. Okay. Financial exploitation is really the category of abuse that I deal with the most often here at Bayview. We have a physician who is actually a family member of a resident here who was getting narcotics from one of our residents, narcotics that she no longer needed, and was reselling them at a discounted price to some of his lower income, lower income patients. Okay, that's uh, not just exploitation, that's illegal on so many different levels. Uh, so in addition to reporting to the state, we reported to the Department of Health and all the other authorities necessary as well. But the reason I give you these examples is to help people see that the crazier something actually sounds, the more likely it probably happened. Crazy stuff happens here. Um, crazy stuff happens when you're dealing with vulnerable populations. That is the entire reason why there are laws that are put in place to protect the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable populations. It's not your job to determine did it happen or did it not happen. If you hear something, something that doesn't sound right, even if the person has significant dementia and you think, oh, they're just confused. If they are making any sort of allegation or reference to abuse or neglect, we are reporting that, okay? Final category of abuse is actually considered to be neglect. And neglect is basically just not, not providing the care and services that somebody needs to be safe, to be healthy, to be happy. Uh, the most uh, common example of neglect that we deal with here at Bayview is not following the plan of care. So for people in independent living and assisted living, they have what's called a care plan. And that is what outlines the services that a person needs in order to be safe and to have their needs met. Not following that plan of care um, is an example of neglect. Okay, so it's really important that we know what is listed in that care plan so that we are providing the services necessary to the resident. When a situation of neglect results in an injury, so like a situation where we aren't following the care plan results in an injury to the resident, that's actually considered to be physical abuse. A really good example of that um, was right after I first started here, where a resident in our skilled nursing needed two people to help her transfer in and out of bed. Well, staff was busy, and the staff member assigned to her that day decided, you know what, I'm just, I'm in a hurry, and I'm gonna transfer her with just, uh, with just me. I'm not gonna get somebody to come and help me. Well, the, the caregiver did that transfer from bed into a wheelchair. It resulted in a spiral fracture in her leg. That was done as a result of not following the care plan. That is abuse. Somebody was injured as a result of not following the care plan. So, very important to know what's in those care plans, right? Um, places to find the hotline number. The hotline is absolutely everywhere. The main place to look to locate it is on your name tag. It's also at the front desk, it's at all nurses stations, it's in all break rooms. Uh, most administrators, social workers have it memorized because we've called it so frequently. Um, but it's, yeah, look at your name tag. And if you forget your name tag someday, just ask your coworker, but it's listed right there. The, the hotline number is just an answering machine. It's really easy just to answer a few basic questions. And then the nurse or the administrator here is gonna make it actually an official facility report to the state for any situations of abuse or neglect. So it's okay if you don't have all the information. All you gotta do is call and say, hey, my name is so-and-so, I work at Bayview, this is what I heard, or this is what I saw. That really is all you have to do. Um, I wanna get back to our, our procedure for reporting abuse. I did talk about uh, reporting it to the nurse right away so they can start an investigation. I also talked about reporting it to the state, but I neglected to tell you one key, uh, one key step as well. The very first step is to protect our residents. That's the entire reason there are laws in place. It's all about protecting residents. So if you see abuse happening, you don't wanna go get on the phone with the hotline answering machine while the abuse is still occurring. We wanna do what we can at the moment to stop the abuse from happening. Um, in the past, we only trained on two steps for reporting abuse. We just focused on reporting it to the nurse and reporting it to the hotline. 
Well, one year our state surveyors came out and were asking staff, well, what do you do if you ever encounter a situation of abuse or neglect? And our staff responded with exactly what we had trained them to do. We, they said, well, we report it to the state we report it, and we report it to the nurse. Well, the state worker then asked one of our employees, well, what do you do to protect the resident? And if you can think in your mind about what the worst possible answer is to that question, that is exactly what our caregiver answered. The caregiver said, that's not my job. My job is to report it to the nurse and report it to the state. Well, it's all of our jobs to protect our residents. Very first step, we protect our resident, we report it to the nurse so the nurse can start an investigation, we report it to the state hotline. I think that's it as far as abuse and neglect goes. Um, obviously, there's a lot more examples, a lot more stories, a lot of questions I could answer if you were here in person with me, which you aren't. Um, but hopefully we'll have a chance to, to talk at some point in the future and hopefully you will uh, attend one of my annual trainings that we do each summer. We play Abuse Jeopardy. It's a lot more fun than looking at me on videotape. So, um, next thing to, I have to talk about, uh, just very briefly, is about HIPAA. And hopefully all of you have heard about HIPAA. If you have not, Google it, um, look in your employee handbook, you should be well aware about what HIPAA is because it's a law that applies to you the exact same way that it applies to our residents. HIPAA is a law, it's, gosh, it's a 100-page law that went to effect, I think the year, the year I started here, so 17 years ago. And to me, it was just 100 pages of common sense. It's a law that says you can't share personal health care information with people who don't have the right to know. Um, so like I said, this your health care information is protected. Um, our residents' health care information is protected. A lot of us in the work that we do here are going to have access to our residents' health information. It's important that we are not sharing that with people who don't have the right to know. Um, the best, for most employees, the best thing to do if you're ever being asked questions about another resident's health is to refer them to the nurse because the nurse is going to be the one who has access to the information to know who the power of attorney is, who do we have consents for, who is it okay to disclose information to. Um, the way that this comes up quite frequently here at Bayview uh, with, with most of our employees is that our residents will approach us and say, I know you can't tell me, but, and then they ask a question anyway about their neighbors, about another resident here. Sometimes they're just um, being, you know, a caring neighbor. They're concerned about their friends and they want to know what's going on. Other times, that we got a lot of nosy people here. <laughs> they just, they're trying to get into other people's business. Really, no matter what the intention or the motivation is behind it, we need to make sure that we are not sharing information with people who don't have the right to know, okay? Uh, there's a lot of gossip that goes on here between residents. Uh, speculation about diagnoses or whether somebody's gonna die or not. I mean, it's some kind of crazy some of the talk that happens around here. We need to make sure as employees that we are not facilitating the gossip, that we are not facilitating the sharing of information. All right, so welcome to Bayview. My name is Joel Smith. I am the Health Services Administrator, which means that I am in charge of uh, the Assisted Living Unit, the Health Center or the Skilled Nursing Unit, and the Child Development Center. Also with the Assisted Living Unit is included the Memory Care. Uh, so if you are working in one of those areas, uh, welcome aboard. I look forward to working with you and uh, I know that we're going to have a great time. All right, so some of the things that I want to talk about today are not necessarily the nitty gritty of, you know, the policies and procedures and all that kind of boring stuff. I want to be able to talk about more of some values and some, some real uh, basic values that I try to incorporate uh, not only in my employment here at Bayview, but also in my life in general. Some of these uh, principles that I'm gonna talk about uh, can be applied at, to many different levels and many different things. So I wanna be able to jump into the first principle uh, that I hold probably the highest and the, the most uh, personal to me is what I consider to be the foundational belief. The foundational belief is the idea that when I wake up in the day, I wake up to do good for myself and for others. I want to make sure that uh, I'm a caregiver and so part of my function is to do good uh, for others uh, but to also do good for myself and my family. It's, it's natural to want to do uh, good things like that. 
Uh, however, uh, there's sometimes people wake up to believe that they do good for themselves, but if, if I wake up knowing that I do good for myself, then I know that you wake up to do good for yourselves and for your others, and the person next to you and the person next to them, and every so on and so on. Uh, that's how things should be. We need to incorporate that belief right here in us. Uh, we need to make sure that that is something that we understand about everybody around us. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I don't wake up to think, uh, oh, who can I upset today? Who can I really make upset? Or I know ah, I'm going to wake up today and I'm just going to think, I'm not going to work as hard as I can today. That's, that's just not what we do when we wake up in the day. We wake up to do good for ourselves and for others. So if I know that about me, then I should also know that about you and about the person next to you and about the person next to you on the other side and so on and so forth. Again, if I wake up to do good, then inherently I believe truly believe and truly feel that everybody else around us wakes up to do good, okay? So what happens is inevitably in every day, one thing that we can be assured about is that not everything is going to go as planned. Not everything is going to be perfect. Something, somewhere throughout the day, one little thing is probably going to go wrong, okay? And when that happens, this is where that foundational belief kicks in because we have a choice at this point to make. We can either say, why did you do this? How come you did this? You're such a bad person. I'm going to write you up, right? Or we can choose to believe that we all woke up in the day to do something good, but something went wrong. And what went wrong and how did that occur to have that situation happen again? And more importantly, what can we do to fix it so that the next person that comes in on the next shift doesn't fall into the same trap and have things go wrong again? What can we do to fix it? It's what I call the process. There's something wrong with the process and not the person. We have to keep that locked in here and in here to understand that when something happens, it's our duty to ask, okay, what went wrong and how can we fix it? Because it's not necessarily the person's fault. We're not blaming or pointing fingers. Remember when we point, we have three fingers pointing back at us. So what can I do differently as well as what can all of us as a team be able to do differently? First principle, foundational belief, we wake up to do good. The second principle I like to talk about is called the can-do ladder. The can-do ladder is a situation where if you can imagine in your mind a step, uh, some, some stairs, some steps, and at the bottom of the staircase is, I won't do it. And at the top of the staircase is, I've already done it. And then there's the shades of gray all in between of, oh, I want to do it, but I really can't, or I don't want to do it, and things like that. So when we think about our tasks throughout the day, we want to figure out how we can accomplish these tasks. Because remember, we said in the foundational belief that we all wake up to do good. So part of doing good is making sure that we get some certain tasks done throughout the day. For instance, let's talk about vitals. Uh, if you're a certified nursing assistant and one of your tasks may be to obtain vitals for the nurse uh, so that the nurse can then distribute certain types of medications, right? Uh, and so if the nurse walks up to the aide and says, where are my vitals? How come you didn't do it? Well, the nurse, we already know from the foundational belief, doesn't believe that people wake up to do good, but also there might be something of a problem with the process where we're talking about in our can-do ladder of why those vitals didn't necessarily get done. So instead of saying, why didn't you do this? And pointing those fingers that also point back at you, we could say, uh, you know, uh, Joe, I really needed those vitals. What's happening uh, that is preventing us from getting those vitals done? And then Joe might be able to talk to the nurse and say, well, look, in this room, I have this situation going on. In this other room, I have a person that I'm watching closely because they may fall. Uh, and in this other room, I have this going on. 
What we're doing at this point is we're really explaining our situation and we're communicating, which is the big piece to everything. It's the key to life I call communication. Uh, it's one of those things that you have to be able to express yourself in non-toxic ways to be able to get your point across so that you can get help. And that's how we all work together as a team. So in the can-do ladder, this is the other thing that I say. We, as human beings, can do anything that we put our mind to, right? Right now, we currently have three remote control cars sitting on Mars. A different planet, but we got remote control cars up there that's moving around. One of them's broken, which is okay. The other two still moving around, still finding out about information about the planet Mars, right? And could you imagine back in the 70s before when they were creating these little cars, some guy or some person somewhere, some scientist decided to say, hey, I know, let's put remote control cars on Mars. I mean, could you imagine the people saying, well, you can't do that. Well, guess what? We can do that. There are solutions to everything. It's us as human beings to find those solutions. So when we're talking about getting vitals for a particular person, believe me, this isn't rocket science. This is something that we can certainly do uh, to be able to accomplish throughout the day. It's just finding out those barriers and communicating and prioritizing our work and working together as a team as to how we can get those done. So the can-do ladder. We can do anything that we put our minds to. We just have to be able to say, I can do this, but here's my situation. Anytime that somebody comes at you and asks you to do something and you truly feel like you can't get it done because you've got all of these other things going on, all you need to do is say, I can do this, but here's my situation. It feels so good to be able to say, I can do this, rather than being able to say, nope, you do it yourself, right? I'm all about feeling good, and I'm all about making sure that we want to talk to each other in that teamwork environment, in that teamwork way. So, it, when, it, when the situation arises, and I know it kind of sounds corny, but you can say, I can do this, but here's my situation. All right, so the can-do letter. The last piece that I want to talk about is what I consider to be the drama triangle. The drama triangle is a situation where it is communication, uh, toxic communication among uh, peers and among people in general. This again, isn't just uh, some, a, a situation that occurs at work. It's something that may occur in your personal life. It may occur with your family. Uh, all of these situations, it may happen. For instance, let's take a situation where you have a friend of yours comes up or a peer of yours comes up and says, oh my gosh, did you see Shelly's shoes today? And you're looking at Shelly's shoes and you really don't see the issue with Shelly's shoes, but your friend says, aren't they just hideous? They, they're Skechers, oh my gosh, Skechers are horrible. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, you've developed this relationship with this person and you start talking about Shelly behind her back or sometimes even in front of her. And then Shelly will come around, and every time you come around, you're, dee, you're pointing at Shelly's shoes and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and you're thinking, okay, well, no harm, no foul. But Shelly, at this point, is feeling like there's friction and that there's a problem. And she's not comfortable being around you, or she's even feeling like there might be workplace harassment, or certain situations that make it a toxic environment to work in. And this is where the drama triangle comes in. So we can look at this, and let's break this down for a minute. We look at this as Shelly is the victim. Your friend who talks about Shelly's shoes is the aggressor, right? And you have the choice to be the rescuer or to be the person that just doesn't want anything to do with this type of discussions, right? So what can we do? Ask yourselves, in this situation, if somebody came up to me and started talking about somebody other's shoes, what could you do to, to say to this person in a non-toxic way to be able to get the person to refocus on the things that need to be done today, right? I'm gonna give you another corny saying. And that corny saying is, 
I'm sure the two of you can work it out, okay? I know that it sounds funny, but there's nothing that you can really say about that. So if your person comes up and says, have you seen Shelly's shoes? You can say, you know what? I'm sure the two of you can work it out. What you're telling that person is, is number one, you really don't care about Shelly's shoes, okay? Number two, you've got more important things to worry about, like, gee, taking care of the people that are here at Bayview, right? Because that's what our job is. We're caregivers. We're, we woke up to do good, right? And we know for our can-do ladder that we can do it. It's just when we have people coming and giving us these distractions about silly things like Shelly's shoes, it distracts us from our mission. It distracts us from our personal journey. So I know that I use uh, Shelly's uh, shoes as, as an example, a silly example, right? Uh, it's just to you kind of um, uh, provide a, a simple uh, explanation of the drama triangle itself. But I, I want you to be cautious because there are all shades of gray when it comes to the drama triangle. You know, for instance, like, oh, did you hear that somebody's dating somebody else on the floor? Or, gee, did you see somebody's Facebook page? Can you believe they're still using Facebook? Who uses Facebook? Old people use Facebook. We use Instagram now, right? Uh, and, you know, it's situations like that. Or here's even a better one. Did you hear how much that person is getting paid? These are all situations that you may find yourself that you're intrigued and you might get sucked into that drama triangle, become that rescuer. You don't want to rescue that person because that's when the toxicity starts coming in and that's where things start getting bad and morale starts getting bad and it distracts you from your journey of taking care of people and waking up and doing good in the morning. We want to make sure that we can tell people, we can recognize those situations, and we can talk to those people about how they can work it out with that person. Now, the aggressor, when they're told constantly, over and over and over, from person to person to person, that they need to work it out with a person, they have a choice, right? The first choice is, is that they can quit because maybe they're not gonna get their fix of drama. I'm not sure what the situation may be, but maybe they just don't like not being able to talk bad about other people, and they can now choose to leave. Or, the more reasonable approach is to actually go to the person. Let's walk to Shelly and talk to her about her shoes, right? Because we don't know what the situation is with those shoes until we actually talk to the person. And then when you get that communication, which we've talked about before, is the key to everything, then things start to work themselves out. People have a better understanding of what the situation may be, and people uh, start to work together as a team more effectively to be able to continue on our journey of what we do every day, being that caregiver, being somebody who wakes up to do good. So in, in recap, we've got the foundational belief, we have the can-do ladder, and we have the drama triangle. I appreciate your time. I'm super excited for you guys to be here. Thank you so much for being a part of Bayview. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always find me. I'm either in my office on the A-level uh, or I'm out and about wandering in the facility. Thank you so much. Hi, my name's Kyle Kingsley. I'm the MDS coordinator here, here at Bayview. So first we're gonna talk about quality assurance. What is quality assurance? It is a system of monitoring um, residents and staff concerns, uh, safety, quality of care, infection control, and record keeping. Um, it is also used to increase customer satisfaction and an organization's credibility. Um, it is used as a way to make sure we are doing the right things the right way. Uh, each department has its own quality assurance policy. Um, there are several committees with attendance from a wide variety of departments. Um, some examples, safety committee, ethics committee, employee action committee, etc. Um, the smallest quality assurance unit is every employee. Uh, we strive to be the best customer service provider we can be and provide valuable contributions to our communities. Uh, next we're going to talk a little bit about personal hygiene in the workplace. Uh, personal hygiene contributes to an overall good health and work environment for both ourselves and the people who we work with. There are two components that we're going to talk about briefly. Appearance and cleanliness. Appearance. We should all have a professional appearance when we're coming to work. It should be safe, functional, 
uh, prevent disease, accidents, and injuries. I should send the message that today I'm ready to go to work. Now let's talk about a little bit about the dress code. Um, wearing your uh, Bayview ID badge, um, no jeans except for uh, special events, uh, no open toed shoes, and no clothes with any type of messages on them. Now we're going to talk about cleanliness. Uh, these things should mostly be done before we come to work. These are things such as bathing, hair trimming, shaving, nail care, brushing our teeth, doing our, ironing our laundry, etc. Um, also, we should always be mindful of odors, things like strong colognes um, that people are sensitive to, and also just good oral and just body odors we want to be mindful of. Next, we're going to talk about infection control. Microorganism, microorganisms, um, they can be transmitted from one person to another um, by touching, by sneezing, by coughing, or exchange of bodily uh, fluids. Uh, some examples are blood, mucus, saliva, feces, urine, etc. Uh, you should always assume that everyone is potentially infectious. Uh, we're, now we're going to talk about the chain of infection. Uh, to the chain of infection, you have to have an infectious agent, a reservoir, a portal of exit, a mode of transmission, mode of portal of entry, and a susceptible host. So the infectious agent or the pathogen can be a bacteria, a virus, a fungi, or a parasite. Next we're going to talk about what the reservoir is. R reservoirs are human beings, they're animals, or they can even be an, an inanimate object uh, such as water, tabletops, doorknobs, etc. Uh, then you need a portal of exit. Um, these things leave through uh, reservoirs such as our nose, our mouth, um, when somebody sneezes. Um, they can also travel uh, during, uh, via other routes. Uh, the mode of tr transmission, there is contact, there's airborne, and then there's droplet precautions. There's also, you have to have a portal of entry. Um, this is any bodily orifice, uh, a break in the skin, mucous membrane, etc. And finally, you have to have a susceptible host. Um, this is the person who is going to be sick next. Uh, People who have increased susceptibility are those who have compromised immune systems and also the elderly. Uh, next we're going to talk about uh, the different types of precautions. Um, we're going to talk about standard precautions first. Uh, these are designed to re reduce the risk of transmission of infection and should be used for all patients regardless of what their diagnosis is. The transmission of infection can be prevented by following these simple precautions. Hand hygiene. Uh, this is the most way, this is the most important way um, to prevent infection. This is the most basic and effective means of controlling infections. You want to wash your hands for 20 to 30 seconds or sing happy birthday twice. Um, hand sanitizer is also good, but you should not use hand sanitizer when your hands are visibly soiled. Um, gloves. Um, we, use, we use them um, when we're going to be in contact with bodily fluids, mucous membranes, and even non-intact skin. Um, use when performing personal care on clients, uh, when shaving them, or uh, even if you have open sores or cuts on your own hands. It's important to change them between different tasks and between different clients. Um, next we're going to talk about masks and eye protection. Uh, face shields. Um, we wear them when we're likely to be exposed to splashes, to sprays, um, the blood, bodily fluids, or any other type of um, excretions. Um, gowns, we're going to wear them when we're also likely to be exposed to splashes, sprays, blood, bodily fluids, secretions, and excretions. Um, we don't want to wear these outside of the contaminated area. We want to make sure that we take those off uh, before we leave. Uh, respiratory hygiene, always cover your nose and your mouth when you're coughing and sneezing. Um, perform hand hygiene after contact with uh, any respiratory secretions. Uh, when it comes to linens, we want to handle and transport it in a way that prevents uh, the skin and mucous membrane exposure and contamination of our clothing. 
Also avoid transfer of pathogens to other patients and or the environment. Um, uh, patient care equipment, um, make sure to disinfect and reprocess reusable equipment appropriately before um, we use them on any other clients. Next we're going to talk about universal precautions. These help control the contamination of bloodborne pathogens such as HIV and hepatitis. Um, when we're in contact with a patient's blood or any body secretions that may be contaminated with blood, uh, we want to uh, use protective measures such as wearing gloves, gowns, facial masks, and goggles. Next we're going to talk about droplet precautions. Uh, you must wear a mask when working within six feet of a client. Uh, and you want to make sure that you put that on before entering the room. Um, these are for any clients, these are large droplets. Um, so these are things such as pneumonia, mumps, meningococcal pneumonia, etc. Um, um, I might have to change the batteries. Oh, okay. or unless you have like how many? Not. No, let, I'll let you keep going. Let's see if it runs. Through. Yeah, just a yep, you're good. You're good. Um, contact precautions involves skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, wearing gloves when entering the patient's room and wash hands before and after each procedure. These are for things uh, such as C. diff, MRSA, hepatitis A. They can all be transmitted via this route. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about airborne precautions. These are small airborne droplet nuclei such as measles, chickenpox, and tuberculosis. Uh, you need a negative pressure room uh, is needed when caring for these clients. Hi, my name is Marty. I'm Director of Facilities, Environmental Services, and Construction. There's a few things I want to touch on today. Um, I oversee the housekeeping crew, the maintenance crew, and of course the construction crew. One of the first things I want to share with you is our disaster response manual. Each of your managers will have one in his or her office. So what this covers is earthquake, fire, armed intruder. For each department, it has a different response. So it's a good idea to become familiar with this. And after everything is said and done, we will be doing end services with each department regarding those three items. Another thing is safety data sheets. Each of your department has a uh, binder with safety data sheets in it. What these do is they define the type of chemical you're using as, and what you need to do is if you're using a certain cleaner or in the kitchen or a chemical in skilled nursing, you need to read that safety data sheet first. You have to know what to do in case you get it in your eyes or maybe you swallow some. Um, after the fact, it's not good enough. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to um, Call me, um, you can go through the receptionist to get a hold of me, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Have a good day. Hello everybody, my name is Juliana, and I am the Spiritual Care Director here at Bayview. I'm also chap a chaplain, and that's kind of how I'm known, I feel like. Um, and usually, when I'm in front of people for for real, <laughs> yeah, I'm in front of you all, but it's a video. Um, I ask people um, if they know what a chaplain is. And it's, I feel like it's not that well known. Um, a chaplain is like a pastor or a spiritual leader who doesn't work in a place of worship, but works um, in other, or, um, other organizations like hospitals, nonprofits, um, retirement communities. And one of the key differences that I see is that um, a chaplain is not, does not have an agenda other than people's spiritual well-being. So I'm not trying to convert anybody or get anybody to believe any certain thing. How I see my job is supporting whatever your spiritual path is. Um, so your well-being and your connection. And spirituality can be um, defined broadly as how we make meaning and how we are connected to ourselves each other and the broader community and world, and for some people also to a higher power or God. I'm here for all residents and staff. Um, my office is past the chapel on the first floor. Um, just keep going down to the end of the hall, you'll find me. Uh, feel free to leave me a voicemail or email me. I'm a really good listener. I think that um, that's probably my best skill set is helping people to hear themselves and helping people to um, find their own truth and process whatever it is um, that's going on in their lives. So people say, 
uh, chaplain, give me a word or give me an answer, that's, that's hard for me. Um, I'm better at listening. So if you just need some listening ears, um, please give me a call and I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, as far as what I do throughout the building, you'll see me on all the different levels of care. I offer um, worship services, and they do tend to be Christian because the majority of our residents are Christian. Um, however, that doesn't mean that um, if they're become, we did Buddhist meditation for a while um, and we've done interfaith panels and I'm hoping to um, become more and more uh, open. Oh, we did a Hanukkah party. I'm hoping to become more and more open to interfaith um, programming here at Bayview. Uh, what else? Um, I'm in charge of a few committees here at Bayview. Um, they're mainly staff, but some residents are on them. I'm in charge of social accountability, which is how we, as, as a nonprofit, give back to the greater community. And I'm also in charge of the ethics committee, which is uh, practicing with some of our top employees, our key employees, um, making ethical decisions. So that's spiritual care in a nutshell. And uh, the other thing I'm supposed to talk to you all about is corporate compliance. So I am the corporate compliance officer. And on the back of your badge, you'll have two different, uh, two different lines. There's the corporate compliance hotline, and then you'll see my name. And there's also the abuse hotline. So corporate compliance is about mainly our um, licensed skill, skilled nursing facility because corporate compliance is about Medicare or Medicaid fraud. Um, we're required by law to make sure there's a way for employees to report any suspicious activity. So if you see an example is um, people saying that they're giving services to residents but not, um, billing maybe for half hour of physical therapy but you, you notice that they're in there for five minutes or you feel like um, we're keeping a patient in skilled nursing for a long time that doesn't need to be there. Those, those are things that would be really, really wonderful and helpful. If you would please tell your supervisor if you feel comfortable. If not, you can leave an anonymous um, message on that hotline. I check it weekly and um, there's never any retaliation for any reporting. It's, um, it's really important that we are using funds uh, ethically.